All right, so we're getting started here. I'm Jason Hull. This is the Door Grow Show, and where we talk about property management, things that are of interest to property managers. And I have a special guest here, Michael Montero of Buildium, the CEO of Buildium. And uh, I'll let Michael kind of introduce himself, but a little preface Michael is the CEO of Buildium. Building is a pretty big company if you haven't heard of it. And they recently took over all property management, which every property manager is uh, pretty familiar with that, at least in the US. And um, and they've you've got how many people now? At how many different businesses? 12,000, I think is the biggest we number have I've seen. 12,500 customers, yeah. Mostly in the US, but, but in over 40 other countries outside of the US as well. So, Michael, I thought it was pretty interesting the last time we spoke and you told me that you commute by boat. And I noticed you put that in your bio here. So, so did you commute by boat this morning to work? I, I did indeed. It is getting cold, though. I'm not sure what the what the temperature is where you are, but it's winter's finally hit here in Boston, Massachusetts. It's about 15, 20 degrees with the wind chill. So, yeah, I took a boat. It is covered. It is heated if that's your next question, but it is a nice way to get into work. It takes me about 35 minutes to, to get to where, to work from where I live on the South shore. Great. Great. So yeah, I don't, uh, I don't commute by boat. I don't even commute, which is nice. So, <laughs> so cool. So Michael, tell, tell me a little bit about you and how you got your start and what, where you came up with Buildium. Then we can get into this cool thing that we're going to be talking about your survey that you did for this state of the property management industry. Yeah, sure. Well, I'm a, I'm a native. I grew up here in Massachusetts, about an hour south of Boston. Went to school in the Boston area, then came out of school with a computer science degree. So did software development for about 10 years, built software, designed software for some big companies at a couple of large technology consulting companies. And at the second stop, toward the end of my career at, at this other consulting company, I met my, my co-founder, Dimitri. George I won't I won't make you spell it. Took me a while to figure out how to spell it. But as a, as a consultant met Dimitri and and learned after meeting him that that he and I had this shared interest in in real estate. This was about 2002. And so we together bought a rental property together down in Providence, Rhode Island, about an hour south of Boston. And over the span of about a year and a half to 2 years, we bought two more buildings and and had about 25 tenants or so. And and I can remember pretty vividly, Dimitri was the guy that was responsible for keeping the books. He was the one responsible for making sure all our tenants had paid rent. And and I remember asking him one, one day if all of our tenants had paid their rent. And he looked at our bank balance online. He was looking at all the different deposits that had come in. And he, he said something like, I don't know, it looks pretty close. And uh, and I wasn't looking. I, I wasn't expecting that. I was expecting a yes or a no. And uh, and uh, it was really at that moment that I said, "This is crazy." Where, you know, we make software for a living, and we're not even using it to manage our our properties and our tenants. And and so I started to look. Started to look for software again. This is around 2002, 2003. Found a lot of software at the time. It was all, of course, desktop based back then. And and universally, it was all either really hard to use or really expensive, just way more than what we needed. So, so Dimitri being a build it kind of guy said, why don't we just build something online for us? And, and so we did, and we thought if it was useful and valuable for us as, as property managers, maybe it would be useful for others. And, and that's really how it started. That was back in 2004. So that was a, 11 years ago. We're coming into our 12th year as a, as a company this year. Over a decade. Long time. I know. <laughs> lots changed. Lots changed since then. Yeah. So, so for those that aren't familiar with building and the software, why don't you tell us just a little bit about that? What makes it unique in the space? Um, Cause there's, there's a few different, you're in always in the top three, especially for residential property management lists that I see for back office. Yeah. So, so. you're right. We focus on residential, some of our customers do manage a mixed portfolio of res residential and commercial, but if they're doing commercial, it tends to be a small part of their portfolio. It might be storefronts or retail, but it's primarily residential. We focus on management companies that manage both rentals and community associations. A number of our customers do both, in fact, although we have several that just do one or the other. 
And and what makes us different? There are, as you said, we're we have we have um, a number of competitors. We operate in a crowded crowded space for sure. Um, everyone in this in this market that sells property management software like us will talk about helping to make management managers more efficient and, and profitable. They do that. We do that by streamlining and automating the low value stuff, the time consuming stuff. So so management companies, managers can focus on the higher value stuff like growing their business and providing customer service. But the truth is, everybody talks about that. What really makes Buildium sure. unique is a uh, really two things. One is that we're the only property management solution in the industry, the the only one that, in addition to making you more more efficient and more profitable by streamlining, streamlining and automating, we actually help our customers grow. We help them make more money by helping them win new new contracts, win new clients, and that's with the acquisition of a marketing service called All Property Management that you mentioned earlier. So, so that's that allows us to to help customers make make more money and and we do that with with software, intuitive software that that really balances a few things. Power, it's got to it's got to be able to do do uh, a number of things well, but but we balance that power with with simplicity and ease of use, and and those are the things that make us different in the in the uh, in the industry. Great. Yeah, I remember doing research on biggerpockets.net and looking at the different property management tools a couple of years back. And the overall feedback that I saw, I saw a lot of people recommending building. And the, the, the feedback was generally that it was intuitive and easy to use. And I think when it comes to software, that's always going to be the number one factor in adoption, like whether people use it or not. Yeah, well, so. you know what? Everybody is a consumer and everybody's used to software on the consumer side that's that's really easy to use, that, that has a really nice user experience. And it's only in the last few years that the companies like Buildium that sell software to businesses versus consumers have started to really focus on the user experience. And, and, and we do it for two reasons. One is we think it's just part and parcel with setting the highest standard for how business should be done. But the truth is companies are demanding it. They know what sort of experience they're getting on the consumer side. And so they're demanding that same experience on the business side. And so for, for those reasons, we've been investing heavily in it for a number of years. Cool. Yeah. So, so if you're a property manager that doesn't have back office software, you are operating in the stone ages. So I definitely recommend you check out Buildium. I've already got a link here on the sidebar. It goes, I, I'm a, I'm an affiliate now. I got to sign up as affiliates for everybody, but I've got, awesome. <laughs> um, I've got your the affiliate link there for door grow and people can click right on that. And it's got a two week trial. It looks like so free trial so they can test it out and play around with it. But that's a great place to start, even for, especially for people that have really small portfolios and they're managing it by themselves and they haven't yet gotten a property manager tool. Try out building them. I think it's, it's probably the easiest of the bunch to start out with little plug there for you. So, so let's get into this cool report. I'm going to hold this up here. I've got this printed out here. The uh, state of the property management industry uh, report. Tell us a little bit about this and uh, how you got this data. Yeah, sure. So this is a report that we did for the first time. We put it together in August of last year. It is an annual report that we plan on on updating each year based on new research. We, we conducted some research with the help of, of all property management and, and ended up surveying over a thousand property managers, property owners. And we did it with one, really one objective in mind, and, and that is to try to uncover some insights and, and um, findings, things that we think are going to help property managers be more competitive. So we wanted to understand the well, as it says, the state of the, the industry to try to uncover some of those trends and hopefully unservice a few nuggets that, that property managers can use to, to be more competitive. So that was really the objective and we're committed to the industry. So it's something that we plan to do every year. And, uh, and as I say, it's based on responses from over a thousand property managers and property owners. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting. I liked, I liked the results. I read through this last night and, um, it's really helpful to get this high level perspective of the industry as a whole. I think I'd be even more curious to see on your future report, a segregation between the multifamily and the single family. Mm. Uh, because, and some of these things I had to question uh, because the numbers might be different depending on 
you know the different type of business but let's let's get into it so so tell us about your first point here yeah well there were really three key findings there's a lot of data the report's 16 pages long and and so i think we're going to make it available for people to download after the this blab but there were really three key findings that came out of the report uh, the first is that it's it's super important to understand really what your competition is doing and also understand benchmarks that are out there within your industry in order to remain competitive. You can't you can't improve, you can't optimize how you're doing business unless you know how you're doing. And one measure of how you're doing is is what your your competitors are doing and how they're doing. So, for example, we found that that um, over 90% of respondents, property managers, are offering five basic services. These are going to come as no surprise. They're 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 helping with the rent collection. They're they're screening, and mm -hmm. uh, and and they're also advertising vacancies and marketing. And then they're doing financial reporting. Those those are those are services that the overwhelming majority of your competitors are offering today. But what was interesting is as as those companies get bigger, as they begin to manage more units, they start to offer more services. So, for example, over 81 percent of property management companies that manage over 500 units are offering around 10 services. So that's up from, from the 90% or so that are offering those five basic ones that I talked about. So if you wanna be competitive and, uh, and compete with these other companies, it's really important to know what services they're offering. Further, once you understand that, it's, it's important to know how they're charging for those services. So an example there is that we found a majority of property management companies are in fact charging an application fee, a rental application fee, but, Surprisingly, that means that that 24% are not. They're either not charging a fee at all, or if they are, they're refunding that fee if they don't end up renting the apartment to that applicant. So, so a quarter of the companies are are clearly leaving money on the table. And uh, and so again, if you don't know what the competition is doing, if you don't know what they're charging for those services, it's hard to stay competitive. Right. You got to add some services. So. A lot of these services seem like they would be really simple or like givens for the industry as well. I, you know, so you've got like the 12 services listed here in the graphic on here in the report. And if you guys want to get access to this report, you can, um, you guys already set up a link for this. So you can go to buildem.com slash blab, which we're in right now, B-L-A-B. So, and you can get that report. You just pop in your email and, and they'll send you this, this PDF. But um, I thought it was really interesting that um, there was kind of this cutoff, it seemed like, uh, with property managers right around the, the sales brokering. So some property managers don't do sales, some do. And it seemed like that's kind of a, kind of a cutoff point. And then I also noticed that um, the landlord-tenant law advising. So some areas have rent control and have these yep. challenges. And so that may be kind of area specific, maybe somewhat, but maybe there is, um, yeah, and that's a big deal in rent control areas, I noticed with clients. And then the insurance services, that sounds like something they could easily just add. Like it's like no, not very many people are doing it, only 19% in insurance services, they could just go sign up, add this additional upsell that they can offer to their clientele to create a little more safety, certainty, with their clients or have a premium package that includes that. And I think that'd be really easy for them to offer. So um, the other stuff, if they don't have a software like BuildVM or, or some of the other softwares that are out there, um, the e-payments and, and, and the management of maintenance and all these different things becomes a bit more difficult. And for so sure. sometimes just by implementing a decent back office, they're gonna uh, add services which is kind of a, a no brainer if they can increase their capacity. So. Yeah, you're you right. I mean, the ability, the ability to offer these services, um, it hinges on your ability to deliver them efficiently and cost effectively and, and technology can definitely help you in that area. Yeah. Um, fulfillment's a big challenge for property management companies, especially when they're small. I was on call just before, um, before this and the property manager was, He's, he's a solopreneur, he's doing this by himself and he's at that stage where he's got a, a portfolio, but he's struggling to do everything himself, but yet he doesn't have the capacity to bring on more, um, more business 
to have more money to be able to hire somebody. So he feels kind of stuck. And um, I told him to fire some clients. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's so sometimes. Limiting his capacity. He had yeah. some clients that were just taking a lot of time. And I said, you need space. And if you don't have space, then you're either charging too little. So we went over that. He was charging just fine. So the other thing you were talking about is fees. So some people, there's two kind of points of view. Some people go with the try to be the low flat fee guys. Mm -hmm. And then some people go on percentage. And some people, when they're struggling, they start thinking about doing the flat fee. Mm -hmm. But it looks like most people are doing percentage-based fees. looks like yep. the majority. And to some degree, that, that also varies based on the type of property you manage. So what we find is that those that are doing a lot of community association management, managing condominiums oh, sure. and help. HOAs, that tends to be a flat fee per door. Right. But in, uh, in, as, as you just noted in the report, if you're managing rental property, then the predominant fee structure is a percent of rent. Yeah, yeah. So on the fee and the, the amount of um, per unit and all this kind of stuff, that would be where I think, think there would be an interesting divide between the multifamily and residential. Yeah, I'm we could probably do that. I'm sure we have that demographic and it's just a matter of, of slicing the data differently to show how those, those um, uh, cool. how, how the results are different. Yeah, if you put together like a specifically hyper-targeted multifamily one and a hyper-targeted residential one, those would be some really cool reports. Um, focus is power, right, when you target things. That's so right. that would be really interesting to see the, the, if there was a big difference on that. But um, I noticed that on the fee pricing, that I think that would differ too, because multifamily, you, you're not usually seeing 10% on multifamily units. But you, you might see more like maybe four. But then on uh, single family homes in a lot of lower uh, rent areas, 10 percent is pretty normal. Pretty, pretty typical. Yeah. Eight, eight to 10 percent. Yeah. So um, in coastal areas, not usually, but their rents usually insanely high. So they're making plenty of money. <laughs> you don't feel too bad for them. Yeah. No, no. So, um, yeah. So this is really good stuff. So I think, again, I think you're right. Like. The biggest thing I like to challenge clients to do, so I, I noticed in your report it mentions to be competitive with fees, and so I think it's really good to look at your competitors and know what the fees are. I like to challenge clients to not just be competitive, but to price themselves at the high end of the market and then in their market, so they need to know what the market's doing, price Absolutely. themselves at the high end, and then um, make sure they're delivering value and know how to sell at that level to be that higher percentage property management company in their market. Because if you're at the low end and you're always competing on price, that's a really painful place to be in any business model. So it is. You, it becomes a you, you become viewed as a as a commodity, and and you don't want to differentiate on price because over time that's a that's a losing proposition. That's a tough place to be, like you said. Yeah, so so I think agreed advice is you know price high and deliver really high value if it's possible in your market. So cool. So um, so let's so let's uh, let's get into the other thing that I had down is um, in my notes here. I thought it was really interesting the other pricing structure. What do those kind of look like? You said usually it's a combination of both. In the yeah, well, we, we see people that will charge a percent, but then there's a monthly minimum. So if that rental amount varies, they, they're guaranteed to get a certain dollar amount per door. So we've seen that variation. We've, we've seen variations on whether people get a percent, even when the unit's uh, vacant in some markets, they're getting they're getting that percent of the of the expected rent, whether the unit is 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 vacant or not, because the presumption is there's still some work to do, even if you're trying to market it and fill it. So mm -hmm. those are some of the variations that we see beyond just a straight percentage or a straight fixed amount per door. Yeah, the other thing I've seen is some companies play this game where it, essentially it's almost percentage based, but they position it as a flat fee and they have tiers. Mm -hmm. So based on the range of the amount of rent they're collecting, it's on tiers. So, yeah, uh, I think it's really easy with flat fee firms, especially if they're low priced, to get a lot of doors. It's like they, they, they can get a lot of doors, but then the problem is becomes fulfillment because they're, they're dealing with so many problems and sure. high-end properties take a lot less effort. So they, a lot of the flat fee guys that are really low flat fee, I see them get into what I call the cycle of suck. 
I call it. <laughs> it's a good, it doesn't sound like a good cycle to be in. No, so the cycle sucks really simple. So it's four steps. So basically you take on crappy uh, owners, mm-hmm. right? They're really uh, price sensitive. They don't care about your value. You're, you're a number to them. And then they, you, they don't want to put money into the property and because they're penny pinchers. And then you, their property, whether it's amazing or not, becomes kind of a crappy property or they have a crappy property. And so that's the second step. And then if you have crappy properties, it doesn't matter how great your tenant screening is. If you're doing amazing tenant screening, you place an A grade perfect credit tenant into a property that the owner won't invest in mm-hmm. or is unwilling to fix things on, you then become the crap shield for a slumlord essentially. And you're put in a painful position. And then the next step, so then you have crappy, uh, at the top you have crappy owners, crappy properties, crappy tenants, and then what kind of reviews are you going to get? And reputation, crappy reviews and crappy reputation online. And then what kind of owners do you attract? That's the cycle of suck. It continues. So then you attract crappy owners. So to yeah, I mean, that, I, the challenge is usually to make sure that you're clear on the types of properties you actually want to manage in that aren't going to cost you an incredible amount of time, energy, resources, because one bad property is infinitely worse than um, you, it's probably equal to 10, 20, maybe even 100 good properties, depending on how bad that situation is. So, yeah, I mean, that's Jason, that's critically important in any business. We, you know, we call that the ideal customer profile. And so it's, it's, as you said, it's, it's critically important to understand very clearly what what does your ICP or ideal customer look like so that you can you can direct all of your your sales, your marketing, your efforts to try to attract more of those? And it's funny, I talk to a lot of property managers and and they all sort of seem to fall into the same trap early on. They mm-hmm. they tell you that they're in the beginning as they're starting out, they their their ICP is basically anybody that will yeah, uh, anyone. That will, <laughs> you know, that, that will pay them. They'll take any business, anybody. It doesn't matter if it's rental, if it's if it's commercial, if it's HOA. It doesn't matter what type of property in which geography. It's amazing. You'll have guys that property managers that are managing properties in all these disparate locations. Yeah, like an and, hour away. And, an hour yeah. away. And then they, they get to a point where they realize this is just not sustainable. It's not sustainable. And managing an association is very different than managing a rental. And it's hard to get really good at what you do if you don't have focus. And it's also hard to differentiate because then you, 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 you're, you're providing the same sort of generic service to, to everybody and everyone. So it's hard to really stand out in the market if you're not really clear on what that, that idea deal customer looks like yeah and you know and i get it if that's how a lot of us start in business you know you take on everybody but if you're targeting everybody in marketing you're targeting nobody essentially and that's the challenge too so but yeah a lot of people that's how they build their confidence they start that the challenge is they keep these clients on so Mm -hmm. if you do level up eventually like like some of the clients I spoke to today, if you do level up eventually, then you need to start firing these people that are big time sucks. I talked to a really awesome property manager. He's got thousands of properties and he says every month they at least make sure they fire like their worst three um, properties. They look at how many requests are coming through, maintenance requests, problems, whatever. And if they're on this list, they, they let them go. Mm-hmm. And so if you're, it, but you feel a lot safer if you're actually acquiring properties, if you have enough deals coming in, then, Hey, yeah, you can let go of the riffraff that aren't causing you issues. So cool. Well, um, let's go on to your, your second uh, point in your report here. Yeah. The, the, the second thing that we found is that just as it's really important to understand what your competition is doing so that you can be more competitive, it's really important to understand what pain your your ideal customers, your prospective clients are experiencing so that you can capitalize on, on opportunities. So a, a great example is that what we found from the survey is that 48% of property owners, landlords, Um, This probably won't come as a surprise, but almost half of them find marketing and filling vacancies um, pretty unpleasant. They don't like it. It's it's not uh, anything they look forward to. And and 67 percent, almost uh, uh, three quarters feel like they're they're not even equipped to do it. So so half of them don't want to do it. And and almost three quarters of those that that um, were surveyed say, even if I wanted to. 
I don't think I can do it well and effectively. And so that's a that's clearly an opportunity um, to offer that service. That's that's presumably why so many of of uh, property managers and and your competitors are offering that service because there's an opportunity there. So understanding what pain your your customers are experiencing, your clients are experiencing is really important. So take the time, take the time to ask. Uh, it might it might help you uncover an opportunity in your market, a service that you can offer that no one else is offering. Yeah, I think that I'll, uh, this kind of goes back to the previous point that if you take on too many bad properties or all the riffraff in the industry or in your market, your ability to provide good service and your ability to deliver and fulfillment is going, your capacity is going to be limited. There's always going to be a difficulty in that area and providing great service and being able to really devote time energy towards this taking on these new properties is going to be a struggle because you're overwhelmed and shelling out tons of money on staff to manage a, a large number of problems. So um, now in, I noticed you have these different points, like number one was like prompt communication. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. So I mean, take, communication. think about it any, seems so, seems so simple and so obvious, but think about, think about any business that you're in. Um, one, one measure of, of, of customer satisfaction or one, one thing that influences customer satisfaction is, is how responsive you are no matter what business. So, so this could be, this could be tenants that are, that are calling or, or emailing about a, a particular maintenance issue. And, and so your ability to, to field those calls quickly and, and be able to provide timely updates is, is really important. It's going to influence customer satisfaction there. And, and similarly with your, your property owners, I was talking to someone, a property manager a couple of weeks ago, and he said that um, they had found this service, this call center service. And, uh, and I automatically assumed that, that the service was there to answer support calls, maintenance calls that come after hours for tenants. Mm -hmm. And he said, no, no, the, the number one source of, of, um, of inquiries is is our our property owners when we send out those statements at the end of the month when we send out those checks um, uh, those owner those owner checks we get lots of questions about about the amount even though we're sending them statements and so we get we most of our inquiries come from 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 our from our clients having questions about the about the money about the statements and trying to understand the finances and uh, and so their solution, that that property manager's solution to making sure that he was really responsive to those inquiries was to was to hire a call center that could provide that that service um, when when that call volume is highest. So it's um, it's critically important to to be responsive and prompt. Uh, it's a it's a critical factor in in terms of customer sat. So have you ever heard of the? Um, there's this great book. I think it's called First Break All the Rules, and it was put out by the Gallup organization who did a survey. They did a bunch of surveying and, and they pulled in. And part of the, one of my great takeaways from that book was they had this customer satisfaction pyramid. At least that's what I call it. And they um, they talked about, and just like your survey points out, the number one thing owners were, were rating as the most important quality for a property manager to possess was prompt communication. In that report, they called that availability. So that's like the foundation of the pyramid is accuracy and availability so accuracy was the lowest rung on this pyramid of the most four most important things for customer satisfaction accuracy is just doing what you actually say you're going to do mm. like you say you're going to do inspections do inspections right seems yeah. really simple just don't lie right yeah and then the next level beyond that was availability now the interesting thing they pointed out is that you will if you are perfectly accurate and perfectly available you're just not screwing up is basically what they said. Like that's expected <laughs> and demanded. That's yeah. expected yeah, and demanded. That's, that's the bar. Yeah. That's, what that's the bar. And in property management, if you're not like available, if they can't reach you and you're not prompt in your communication, you don't answer phones. It's always voicemails and stuff like that. And you can't the, the assumption instantly is that you you're having trouble like just doing anything. And yeah, so. it, it, it does sound so fundamentally basic, but as as a consumer, I mean, we all have experience, or many of us certainly that homeowners have experience hiring a contractor, a plumber, electrician, a general contractor, and and the number one complaint I hear, the one, number one thing that I've experienced is just 
lack of lack of communication, lack of communication promptness. And so um, as, as, as crazy as it sounds, property managers can differentiate in their market just by doing those two things that you talked about, um, being prompt and being available. Um, that, is, that is a way to, to, to stand out in, uh, in this industry because so many property management companies, managers fall short. Yeah, that's it's surprising, but it does seem to kind of plague the industry maybe more so than other industries. I mean, you could imagine a waiter at a restaurant if they were not available and not accurate with your order, they would not be in business or, or at that job very long, right? But that's right. <laughs> property management it seems to kind of run rampant. So the next two levels above that would beyond accuracy and, and availability is then partnership and advice is what they said. So partnership is basically where they actually believe you're in it with them. Like you're involved mm -hmm. with them. They believe that you're on the same side of the fence as them. And um, that kind of goes to that third point where they, it says understands the needs of today's renters. So that's like the third thing owners thought was a big deal. And then the second thing was a thorough understanding of landlord tenant law. Um, number five was excellent customer service. Um, use of the latest property management technologies. A lot of these things all relate to these these four things. Availability, yeah. accuracy, partnership, that you're in it with them, they believe it. And then the highest rung is advice. And when advice. you get into the advice stage, that's where you are not just with them, but you are an authority to them and they trust you. They yep. trust you to know how to manage this investment and make them money. So Yeah, and that's when you you stop becoming a commodity, offering commodity services. That's where the, the intrinsic value lies and that's how how these managers can can really differentiate themselves so um some of these are really simple like the the ninth one was make spot check property inspections like like that's kind of what they expect like do some inspections have excellent vendors and contractors with seven etc so you can take a look at this report guys you can download it again um you can get it at uh, um at uh buildium dot com slash blab and get that report but uh, i thought these things are really interesting anybody can take a look at their business and look at these areas and, and figure out are am i doing these things that owners expect because these are big deals so now i was really curious uh, about this uh, figure eight this next section hmm. tell me a little bit about this the top 10 lead sources based on the likelihood to convert new business yeah. So like you obviously you have all property management, which is probably like the um, what do you have here on number five leads from online lead service. So what's the best way to get leads? Well, there's it's that's an interesting question. What is the best way? Property managers will tell you the number one channel, the number one source for them is is referrals and in, in word of mouth, which which makes sense. I mean, it's 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 the way a lot of us buy things today. We we if we don't go. We don't hear from a friend or a colleague. We're we're looking online at reviews, so it's not surprising that that continues to be, for for many property managers, the number one number one source. But um, what we're finding is, as you noted, that that property managers are having to diversify and look across multiple channels. It's not enough to rely on just word of mouth and referrals. Um, many property managers are having to diversify their channel mix in order to meet their growth goals. So we're seeing people now, um, you know, they're, they're going online, they're, they're doing organic and, and content marketing and a bunch of other inbound marketing uh, tactics to try to attract people to their website, people that are looking online, not just for property management services, but, but might be looking online for information about, about other things. And, and uh, so through inbound marketing, these property managers are, are investing so that they get discovered online. So organic is a channel, um, paid is a channel. So that could be managed AdWords or other paid online advertising. Um, online lead sources like, like all property management is another source where people are going to to find leads to grow their business. Um, so it's a it's a multi pronged approach, and and property managers that really want to grow their business are finding that they have to they have to explore all the channels, and then they have to be able to measure it so they can understand which channels are most effective, so they can figure out where to invest more. They have yeah. to have some sort of measurement in place. 
Yeah, I think you're dead on. One of the things I've noticed is that um, most property managers, that's where they get most of their leads is, is through referrals. And if you can really pin that down and get referrals in a good way, it's going to be killer because referrals are pretty much a slam dunk when it comes to sales. Usually the close rate's incredibly high. You're not having to really actually sell or convince them. They're pre-qualified. So referrals are, are, are awesome. And nothing's going to convert better than referrals. Now, the mistake I see a lot of people make is they start doing either internet-based leads, pay-per-click leads, um, or other channels where people are coming in cold and they start to play that game. And then they assume because those leads are nowhere near as effective at, at, and they're nowhere near as effective at closing and it takes more time to nurture them that they think it's just bad. They're like, oh, I tried pay-per-click or I tried this and it's just... But re the reality is they just don't know how to sell because they never had to. And that's where sales, I think, becomes this really big leaky stage in their process. And that's where that's exposed is when they start trying to play this game of getting leads from APM or getting leads through pay-per-click or whatever. Then the problem is sales, but then they turn around and they don't want to internalize. So they look at the lead sources and say, oh, this must not be working. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I think another mistake that people make is or another another um, another challenge is that a lot of a lot of property managers aren't sure how to measure the return on 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 investment for those different channels. So they don't they don't really know how to measure it. Um, and if they do know how to measure it, they make the mistake of 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 only utilizing those channels that have the highest ROI. Now that works fine if that particular channel can deliver the number of leads that you're looking for in order to meet your growth goals. But usually it, you, you, you need to tap into multiple channels in order to get the volume of leads that you're looking for in order to hit the, the growth objectives you have for your business. It's not enough just to invest in the channel that's providing the highest ROI. And so then it becomes really important to understand what is the ratio between the cost to acquire a new client through a particular channel and the total value over the lifetime of that that potential client so for example if if um, you know referrals is going to cost you you know next to nothing in acquisition costs you didn't pay for the referral and uh, and so the ROI on referrals is is pretty darn good but unfortunately most people can't satisfy their growth goals by relying on referrals alone some you know there's a lucky few that can and that's awesome but but many can't and so they have to they have to tap into other channels that aren't going to have that kind of ROI but but that doesn't mean they shouldn't invest there. Um, Oh, I think we lost you. And what they ought to be doing is, is all right. So I'm going to I'm starting the recording here again. Uh, Michael's internet seems to have blocked Blab. It, maybe there was just too much uh, internet bandwidth being used to stream. But I spoke with him for a little bit. So he, the second point he was talking about was to really to maximize uh, marketing. Um, and to make sure that you're providing great service, marketing the business, excellent organization skills, hiring the right, all of this stuff related to customer service. And, um, and then talk, figuring out what the owners want. So I highly recommend you check out the report just to get the clarity on what the owners want. All those red bars are what owners want, right? They want these things. So you want to make sure that you're providing those things. That is what they're they're interested in. What matters to them, and at the forefront of that, like we talked about, is availability and accuracy. So, okay. So the uh, the third point that Michael was going to get into to make is that if you really want to be competitive and know what's going on with your competition, you want to leverage the right technology. He said 81% of respondents identify technology as critical, critical to what they're doing. And so, um, yeah, I thought this was really interesting. It, it, some of the, the main points. So the top business challenges at the top of this were finding new clients in, in the survey. So it's the most difficult thing, finding new clients, which is basically prospecting and marketing, right? And um, the next thing was managing resident requests, which is just the fulfillment stuff, like we had mentioned. And then after that is finding good tenants. So remember the cycle of suck thing that we talked about. If you can um, 
I think a, a big factor, so there's finding good tenants, non-paying or uncooperative tenants, maintenance emergencies, tenants causing property damage. Those are all the next ones. All of those things naturally get filtered out based on the type of demographics that you take on. So if you have, I've noticed if you check out great schools in any market and you take a look at, um, you take a look at different areas and you look at the demographics, you look at the per capita income in an area, it's always directly correspondent to the great schools rating on great schools. So, which I think is interesting. Oh, I see Michael pop back in here. All right, we're gonna bring him back in here. Michael. I don't know. I, I don't know that I can tell you we found a solution, but we're back. Well, well, we'll keep you as long as we can have you. So I was getting into the, I was looking over the figure nine. I was going over these pieces. And the point I was making is that um, I've noticed this correlation between when I was looking for a place at great, looking on great schools to see which schools were the best, right? So I wanted my kids to be in like a really high grade school, right? That's important mm. for parents. Yeah. And uh, and I'm sure renters look that way sometimes too, but I noticed it was always directly correlated to the per capita income. Mm -hmm. Even within a city, there were blotches where schools were, and if the per capita income was higher on the great schools thing, the score for the school was higher. It was like mm -hmm. always connected. And I, so even in a single city market uh, that you might target, there's going to be areas that you know you might want to manage properties and where you might not. And depending on the demographics, you're going to have all these major pain points, finding good tenants, non uh, paying uncooperative maintenance emergencies, tenants causing property damage, all this stuff where you're getting trapped into this cycle of suck. A lot of that's going to be caused simply by the demographics, I think, of the area and the types of properties that you're taking on. Yeah, so, for sure. Yeah. So I thought that was interesting that all of those would be tied to some of the biggest challenges. If you can eliminate your all of your biggest challenges and have a property management business that you love, this is this is the fun stuff that I, I like working with clients on um, when we get into more coaching or marketing type stuff. But um, so I already mentioned your point, technology, 81%, identify it as critical, right? So, um, and uh, technology can help with streamlining all this stuff. What do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, um, you're right. 81% of the people that responded to the survey, we asked them to to identify the, the things that they believe are most critical to their success. And technology was, was mentioned by 81%. But more than that, it, it showed up in the top five things uh, that people identified as critical success factors and among things like providing outstanding customer service and, and hiring great people. Hiring be continues to be a challenge for people. That becomes, that turns out that's one of the, one of the barriers that a lot of property managers face when they're looking to grow their business. So, so finding new business is a barrier. And we talked about the importance of diversifying that channel mix and how to measure the ROI and, and, uh, in, in, to not just be looking at the channel that provides the highest ROI, but to be ensuring that that uh, the the ultimate value of that client exceeds how much you caught you, you paid to acquire it. So that's important. That's a big challenge for folks. But but hiring awesome people is is also hard. And and what ends up happening is is property managers don't know how to hire great people, and they end up stuck working. You know, you've heard this old adage working, you know, on the business work versus working in the business. And if you really want to grow the business, you got to be able to extract yourself from from all of the, the day to day so that you can think more strategically about what you're trying to do with the business. And that's hard to do if you're not able to to hire people as you as you grow your your portfolio. So so hiring people is um, is 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 critical to to success along with providing outstanding customer service that we already talked about in technology is right there with them. Yeah, I think the biggest challenge I've noticed with business owners for with hiring people. So there's a really painful transition. Everybody that's been a solopreneur that's gone to having a team knows how painful that transition is, right? There's a great book kind of that touches on that subject called The E Myth Revisited. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've read it. And um, that that transition for I've gone through it, but any business owner that's gone from being a solopreneur to having a team, it's a really painful transition, and largely it's because a lack of clarity, like a lack of clarity on processes, a lack of clarity on what you actually do, lack of clarity on what you, who you want on your team. And I think ultimately where where most property managers bleed hemorrhage, you know, or hemorrhage or massively in that in that area is that they spend a lot of time controlling their team and staff. 
instead of inspiring. So I, I have this phrase that I love to share with clients is that whenever you fail to inspire, you always control, like by default. And so if you're spending tons of time, energy, resources as a property manager controlling your team, then they don't, they don't buy into you. They don't buy it. They don't buy into your message. They don't buy into your purpose. And it might just be that you don't aren't clear on what it is and haven't shared it. Yeah. Clarity is, is you're right. It's so critically important. It, it sounds, it sounds, um, it sounds intuitive, but it's, it's, it's amazing how much dysfunction can be tied back to a lack of what you're trying to do, a lack of clarity. And that's why I read that book as well. The, the uh, E-Myth stands for Entrepreneur Myth, right? Right. Um, yeah. this, and, and one of the things that entrepreneurs underappreciate is the importance of, of writing stuff down, operationalizing things. Um, and, and that's critically important to create that, that clarity so that, that everybody on your team stays, stays aligned. There's another, there's another really good book called The Advantage. The Advantage talks about this notion of organizational health. And, and the author, his, his, his assertion is that you need four things for, for, organizational health. Before I tell you what they are, if I were to ask you what, what three things do you need or, or, uh, for, for, for overall, uh, health, what would you say? Not organizational health, but just living as a, as a person, what are, what are three things that you need to be healthy? I'm going to put <laughs> like you on really the spot. Basic? Yeah, real basic. The most I'd say oxygen one. is a pretty essential one. <laughs> That's the lid, <laughs> but to be healthy, what do you need? What do you need to be healthy? Um, I think essentially you need the mindset to want to. I mean, that's kind of at the core. If you don't want to, that's kind of the first step. Yep. So I would agree with that. You also need sleep. You yep. need you need diet. Exercise. You need exercise, right? But when you ask people what do you need for organizational health, you get a you get crickets because it's not something people are used to talking about. And and so anyway, it's cohesion. That's the first thing. You need a cohesive team, a team that that trusts each other, that works well um, together, that can that can engage in conflict and and uh, and and that's accountable. And there's a whole bunch of things. But but mm -hmm. cohesive team is is number one. Number two is that clarity that you just talked about, so everybody stays aligned. And, uh, and then number three is, is to over communicate that clarity. And, uh, and then four is to continue to over uh, communicate that clarity. So communication is, is not, it's not enough to write it down to operationalize it, but you got to communicate it and continue to communicate it. Yeah, I think, um, uh, yeah, that's great. That's great. I haven't checked out the book. That'd be interesting. So the thing I I work with a lot with uh, coaching clients that have this problem. So if they tell me that they have this problem, like their problem spending a lot of time controlling their staff or they've got people on their team that aren't don't like aren't doing things the way they want things to be done ultimately um that i think that goes back to just whether or not they are inspiring or controlling whether or not they have a clear vision or purpose and so um, i'm a big fan of simon sinek he's got this book start with why and he talks about this mm. purpose getting clarity on what the why or purpose is in the business and um there's other other uh, videos I've seen in books, but uh, one key takeaway that I've gotten where I've realized is that to inspire people it has a is a game changer on your with your team and with your business because if you are um, trying to incentivize good behavior like with dollars, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Yeah, you can try and throw money at, at them and I'll pay you more money if you perform better. It doesn't work. But if they if they really like believe in what you're doing and they feel like that they are inspired by you and they feel like they have a purpose at their job, that like people will work for less pay often. People will work in environments that may not even be ideal, but if they feel inspired or feel like they have a cause beyond just making dollars and clicking off a checklist, they um then the whole business transforms right mm -hmm. and i woke up one day and i had this whole business that uh that i didn't i didn't like and i realized i need to get clarity on what my purpose is and when i got that clarity right so at open potion it's to build awesome relationships and incredibly effective websites and at door grow it's to transform property management businesses like that's what we're all about and if the team members and then you get clarity simon writes in his book um start with why he talks about the all the hows, which are the values that your team espouses. Now, really, ultimately, like at your company, Michael has values, I have values, and the 
the team members that we like the most on our teams are usually the people that have the same value set as us. They're the people that are cohesive, that fit in that environment. And they're the people that naturally want to deliver what you want. And then the types of clients that you attract when you have that clarity and you say, this is why I'm in business. This is how we go about operating our business. Sometimes the clients won't even ask you like what you specifically will do. They won't be like, are you doing tenant screening and evictions, whatever? They just, then they really don't care what you do if there's that level of partnership and trust where you're like, I believe in you and your values and what you're putting out there. Uh, here's my money, right? So so I think that's the game changer with the team is they, they're looking for leadership and they need somebody that can inspire them. And that means you need to have a clear set of what your values are and put that out there to your team. And then if they don't have the same values, once you're clear on your values and you look at your team, you can just fire the people that don't have the same values as you because it'll be pretty clear when you just look at their name on paper. You'll know if you know the team member at all, oh, they don't have these values. Right, yes. whether they share them or not. And I think that's a game changer. That changes the types of clients you attract. That changes the types of tenants that you'll be, you'd be working with, like everything, if when you're clear on your, your value set. So cool. So- Michael, what else do you want us to take away from this report? And then tell us again how we can get access to it. Yeah, well, what I would say is that it it um, it's it's a report that we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and and uh, release annually. We're gonna continue to to do it so that we can stay on top of of trends as they change and continue to provide insights. So, if if people want to download it, it's available for free. You can go to it at buildium.com slash blab, and there's lots of good data, lots of stuff that I didn't talk about today. There's 16 pages worth of really useful insights and, and nuggets, and and uh, we hope that that folks that download it and read it will, will, will learn something, be able to take something away from it that ultimately helps them be more competitive and be more successful. Oh, Michael, we have a question. So um, I don't think we ever got back to number three and four for organizational health. Yeah, it, it was subtle. So number one is a cohesive team. Number okay. two is is clarity. Number three is over communicating that clarity. And number four is again communicating that clarity. It just reinforces. There's really three, but but oh. if you read the advantage, you'll see that they that they 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 frame it as four detail. because because it's it's it sounds it sounds obvious, but. Um, it, that is a place where so many people fall short is the communication. They say, okay, well, I've written it down. I, I, I went over it with my staff, my team, and then they forget about it. They never talk about it again. And it takes us, you know, it takes human beings a number of times before they begin to internalize things. And so if people want to learn more about the advantage, there's a, there's a book I, I highly recommend it. There's also a website you can go check out and, and learn a lot more about organizational health. Cool. Awesome. So first they need to get it to, if your property manager doesn't have an organization yet, you're a solopreneur, then uh, marketing may be the luxury that you don't can't afford yet. And so th I would challenge you to go out and start prospecting. Everybody wants to start with marketing. And then if you're ready to get some leads, usually everybody starts with APM. I always hear it. Start with all property management and start buying the leads, you get them right away and and then you can have other buckets. So real quick, I want to touch on the, the other channel. So I think, like you said, it's a big mistake to put all of your eggs in one basket. Um, if you, even if you are killing it with pay-per-click and you're also then it would still make sense to buy leads from all property management and it would still make sense to be doing local SEO and it would still make sense to do organic SEO because each of these have different people that would be connecting with and they're different leads that would be coming in. And if the, if it's making you money, if the return on investment is there, some will be higher than others, but I would never just trade one that's really high for one that's lower if they're both attracting different different leads. In right. a different business because it's just more. It's more money. So why not have lots of buckets to capture the rain? So that's right. Uh, so cool. So really cool stuff. Get the report. Get all this cool data, and um, and get on their list so that you're getting their their reports each year. Again, um, you can go to uh, doorgrow.com if you want to learn more about leveling up property management. If you need help with websites, marketing or coaching in your business and you want to improve and get escape the cycle of suck. And Michael, we hope to have you again, uh, again with your future reports or with any other topics that might be interesting. Yeah, I'd love to, to do it. Thanks. thanks for having me, Jason. Cool. All right. All right. Thanks. See ya.